Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity, the organizers, to, uh, for me to present something on um, the doping control system and uh, alluding to the phrase uh, leveling the playing field, I decided to uh, give my talk the title leveling the doping field because I actually think that um, we have a problem with loopholes um, that are, um, yeah, unfortunately the escape possibility for athletes um, under the current anti-doping practices. I will allude to this a little bit. Then I will show you expert opinion on it and talk about the politics involved in testing and some questionable data from the testing system itself um, are also going to be presented in order to decide which way to go. Because in uh, human testing, and I'm a mere specialist on humans, unfortunately, so I don't know anything about horses, uh, except that I'm uh, reading about it, and I read some publication on horse doping. But in humans, we have the problem to decide which way to go, to intensify the testing system, or to take other stands in order to cope with doping. Then it's an issue of proportionality in the end. Um, how much testing is justified? Let's have a look at loopholes first. Um, during a statement last year, uh, a VADA extra expert group headed by the VADA founder, Richard Pound, came to the conclusion that in fact there is a um, severe difference between theory and praxis. Um, science seems to be robust, but unfortunately, testing will not enable us to catch the um, very experienced dopers. So what is going on right now? E excellent detectability and therefore a high level of deterrence can be achieved for substances like anabolic steroids, stimulants, heterologous uh, blood transfusion, so a lot of procedures that are considerably old and where we would say they have been used maybe starting 20 years ago. And now the problem is even for substances where we had some very efficient testing established, like 10 years ago for EPO for instance, we are facing the problem that still um, there seems to be loopholes in a way that athletes have very sophisticated ways of applicating those substances. For instance, EPO is taken in, at low dosages in order to keep um, an effect that has been achieved by autologous blood transfusion that is very difficult to detect because it's the body's own blood. And uh, then it's combined with it so that microinfusions combined with EPO make the thing very difficult to be detected even if a blood passport system is established. And then we have other problems like the testing can be circumvented by using very sophisticated um, produced testosterone that is actually not different from the human one in terms of mass spectrometry. Uh, it's difficult to produce but it can be produced starting from a, uh, animal backbone uh, molecule so that you can produce a very autologous testosterone, even epitestosterone. And then our substances on the market like insulin, if you take a very human version of it, it seems to be a powerful drug during training, which could also affect horse racing, unfortunately. Uh, and we have unknown designer uh, steroids uh, going on. But the most intriguing thing is for instance, that substances like IGF-1 uh, that are highly potent, which I will show you um, uh, in a few minutes, and also um, very future things like gene doping will be very difficult to tackle. In fact, m my working group established a doping test for gene doping, but unfortunately, we would think that um, until it's put in place, it could, could still take several years. And also, the problem is, like with every other test, what are the possibilities to circumvent this test? And unfortunately, there are possibilities. So what makes our level playing field uh, a field of loopholes? Um, we have 
apart from um, the theory praxis issue, um, to respect that there is a severe um, disproportionality in um, funding. If you look not at the funding that goes into professional sport as a whole, which is about a minor estimate uh, uh, of is $130 billion, uh, but it's more about the testing. The testing costs us per year about 350 million US dollars uh, in humans. And unfortunately, um, only 6 million are invested in order to have independent um, oversight uh, grants that, that are able to um, lead to discovery of new um, doping detection procedures. And so science is underfunded, I would say. Um, it's a problem because the disproportionality is not reasonable given if we look at what we see here that unfortunately uh, even if you go for 5,000 meter uh, racing in humans, which is a, a, a sports where you can see drug effects pretty clearly, like the introduction of EPO on the market and the severe down uh, uh, going of, of the average time below 13 minutes over 5,000 meters. And then there was the introduction of first generation EPO testing, which yeah then led to uh, amelioration that is not very pronounced, to be honest, but for two and a half years, there seemed to be more cautiousness uh, around the athletes. And then again, um, it turned down quickly until it reached a buttonhole again of below 30 minutes. And then um, you have the increase with second EPO generation testing, but we are now back on track. And we think that testing will not effectively actually test for EPO consumption. So you can do statistics about it and show that these effects are indeed um, very highly significant. And you can have a look on the right-hand side. That is about what you have experienced in the media in the past years. We had a severe improvement over 100 meter flat in humans. So we are now thinking that this could be related to the implementation of um, Increlex, which is IGF-1 on the market in the US first and later on in the EU. And athletes have been training in those regions where the drug was sold uh, or sold first. And it's not only a few athletes, it's more than 20 athletes that have improved their performance so considerably over the past uh, five years that we are afraid we need to have an explanation apart from training and talent. Because there was even improvement in athletes that have been 25 or 26 years old and had a very stable personal best over several years. And then they improved by um, to uh, um, 20 uh, hundreds of a second, which is a lot in sprint and, uh, sprinting. So if we look at empirical data, there is a nice uh, working group uh, from, funded by the IAAF, uh, which is about the blood passport system. And they showed that um, the doping practice with blood amongst athlete is, athletes is very, very spread. Um, there is a country A. If you have a look at the second row, um, uh, it is 78% of athletes, male athletes in this country, supposed to practice blood doping and 50% of the females. If we go to other countries, the levels of abuse seem to be lower, but um, I have to add that this includes discus throwers, shot putters, and disciplines where we would think that EPO is not a big deal or blood doping is not a big deal. Nevertheless, you end up with population statistics where you think that abuse is pretty widely spread. A very conservative estimate is that at least 13% of these top athletes uh, still abuse uh, blood doping techniques. And there is other epidemiological evidence where politics is involved because they are still not published in a scientific journal. And there is the claim that actually IAAF in conjunction with the World Anti-Doping Agency seems to uh, somehow retract the publication or delay publication. 
It was 29% of athletes at the World Championships in athletics that admitted to having abused uh, doping substance or abused doping in the year before um, the games and 45% at the Pan Arab Games. Um, it was a very anonymous technique that has been used, which does not enable you to say specifically which athletes or to make any other comments about which types of sports. But of course, at the Pan Arab Games, there were also horse related sports integrated. So, lessons from a court of law are even the most uh, disturbing thing for us because we had to recognize that even athletes like Lance Armstrong that has been, have been tested or Marion Jones, a uh, track and field athlete, a female one, that uh, they had been tested several hundred times and never turned out to be positive, but were shown to use a whole plethora of different doping substances like polytoxicomanic approaches, we would say, in medicine, because no medical doctor, no sports physician, could really tell what those drugs in combination do within your body. Nevertheless, they were abused. And what we also know is that it is a problem that seems to be related to certain um, groups um, of trainers, to certain groups of sports physicians. So there is a possibility to uh, do investigations and to maybe go beyond just the athlete or in your case the horse, which could be uh, quite about the same. So what about the data we have from testing? Well, the first disturbing thing is if you look at the in-competition tests called IC, I, I'll have to see, there is no pointer, but you see the red numbers and above it there is a 13,000 um, uh, test that have been performed and only 222 turned out to be positive in terms of analytics. This still incorporates athletes uh, that unfortunately are just analytical positives, but um, they have a therapeutic use exemption, so are allowed to take medications. If you compare now in-competition testing, IC, with OOC, you see that more than tenfold uh, OOC seems to be less efficient. And those are the out-of-competition tests. So the tests where an athlete is waking up six o'clock in the morning, so I could imagine that horse racing is now thinking about intensifying the fight against doping. And what we have done in the human field was we intensified the fight against doping always on the shoulders of the athletes, saying, well, uh, let's test them very unexpectedly at six o'clock in the morning. And here's unfortunately the result of it. It seems to be highly ineffective. We did our own analysis, collecting data from the NADOs, and these are just two examples. I took Czech Republic and Germany. They have very terrific reporting, um, but unfortunately, you can see with the positive tests, we are in the per mil range, and especially out of competition, there seems to be uh, a problem with detecting athletes. So, uh, first of all, we thought that's because of stimulants, because certain stimulants are just forbidden in competition, but not out of competition, which could complain the uh, explain the difference. But unfortunately, if you analyze these data again, we had to come to the conclusion that it is not the stimulants, and it's not related to the uh, specificities of in competition testing. It's more related to the fact that we are inefficient out of competition. But how to explain it? How to explain that we refringe athletes' rights and we restrict it and we say, you have to make your data available and everything, and then show that we are just 10 times more inefficient or at least four times more inefficient. That is a problem which I think needs to be addressed when we intensify uh, the fight against doping also in horse racing, and I thank you for your attention.